they're tradable. Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to call this special meeting to order of the Muscatine City Council, October 28th, 2021. Cinda, will you please do the roll call? Councilmember Hopkins? Present. Councilmember Kralich? Present. Councilmember Malcolm? Present. Councilmember Gordon? Present. Councilmember Brockert? Present. Councilmember Gendry? Present. Councilmember Brackett? Present. Seven present, zero absent, your honor. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. The Muscatine City Council is holding this special meeting tonight just to allow for time to get public input on the issue of whether or not to uphold the pit bull ban in the city of Muscatine or consider lifting the ban. And we wanna hear from the public, which is why we called this meeting. Uh, the the, what we're actually talking about is Title VI, Chapter 9 of the Muscatine City Code. So everyone that wanted to speak has signed in, I trust. Uh, we will close that time period for signing up at 7.05, and you could do that in the hallway. What I plan to do is call folks up to, uh, five at a time, and they can line up over here against the wall, leave some space in between each other if you would. Feel free to take off your masks when you come to speak at the podium. Um, and then, then when we get close to, maybe get four of those gone, then I'll call up the next five and that way we can keep the line moving over there. It's really important for us to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak. And so we're asking folks to limit their comments to three minutes. Uh, Cinda is going to uh, time everyone. When you get down to 30, 30 seconds left of your time to speak, a bell will ding. There you go. And then that lets you know that you have 30 seconds left. And then when you get to the, when you hear the bell again, then that means your time is up. So please finish your last couple words uh, and then take your seat if you would, please. That's just gonna make, a, a, make sure that we have everybody an opportunity to say what they wanna say to council. So we're going to start with the first five lining up if they would. Roger Roth, Brenda Hood, Steve Zelmer, Randy Duncan, Tori Depa. Am I saying that right? Depa. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and Faye Chance Sanchez as well. Can you have them repeat their name and address? For yes, me? I will. What we're asking is that each person um, address council, not the uh, not the audience. Please be respectful. It's we believe that we can disagree, but still be respectful and kind to one another. So let's make sure that, that we do that here tonight. And we'll go ahead and get started. Please state your name and address. Roger Roth, Clark House. I ask the voting sovereign's government watching this to not blame this present city council since they have the choice to change this travesty just as Queen Esther corrected the fatal mistake done by one of her patriarchs, King Saul. This breed specific ordinance is a premeditated, pre-planned, pre-organized violation of not only law, but of a violation against city government. If the past city council had used only the other pet slash animal ordinance only, this mistake against the city government would not have happened. Legal law in relation to the pit dog law ordinance, Article 1, Section 1, Iowa Constitution. Mm, dang, I have you. Okay, Article 1, Section 2, Iowa Constitution, Article 1, Section 6, Iowa Constitution, Article 1, Section 7, Iowa Constitution, Article 22, Section 1, Iowa Constitution, 4.2, Iowa Code, the seventh article amendment of the U.S. Constitution, the Ten Commandments, part of 4.2, Iowa Code, the ultimate stare decisis of our constitutional <clears throat> law. One, media is telling the public the Iowa legislative branch General Assembly is not interested in enacting any breed specific doggy laws. City needs to pander to some, but not to all the local insurance companies to remove pit dogs from their insurance policy. Another violation. Um, the morning of the last reading of the pit dog ordinance, did the Muscatine Police Department enter a home where two pit dogs are domiciled? A. Killed one dog. Pit dogs are most likely to kill an animal and not attack humans unless trained to do the latter. B. The other pit dog was seized, observed by the Muscatine Journal carriers waiting for our newspapers. A lot of those carriers had more heart knowledge concerning dogs. The police lacked the knowledge that caused the death of the first dog. 
E. reported the next day in a newspaper. Four, the next day after the passings of the new color of law ordinance where the sitting judge saw this order valid but not aware of its violations of the Iowa Constitution causing support from the Iowa courts. Sometime later, I checked the Muscatine General's microfiche to find the newspaper article missing, a means to cover up the crime while also enacting a violation against the Freedom of Oppress Clause. If still there, please let me see it. I went to the Muscatine County Courthouse to discover who the above mentioned preceding judge was to add discovery to him. The city found out and reacted. May 2011, a day of infamy, a liquidation attempt on a citizen via a police department sniper. This witnessed by a line of people lined up along the curb, neither rounds did hit the victim. Dead man walking. The next day, as I was walking down West 2nd Street to see Police Chief Gary Coder only look up at me, and after the initial shock, took a 180 degree turn, ran back into a store downtown, I passed him by since his action was self-incriminating enough. Uh, thank you. You timed it perfectly, thank you. Brenda, please state your name and address. My name is Brenda Hood and I live at 1224 Park Avenue here in Muscatine. I believe that the pit bull ban is based on ignorance. I believe that every breed needs to um, be judged for its sole merits. Um, the American Indian, the Native Americans, are often said to be savage. So we're judging an entire, you know, person on their title. I think that pit bulls are this. They are how they're raised, just like your children. If you teach your children that violence is good, they'll be violent. If you teach a pit bull to be violent, they will. If you teach your children to be peaceful, to look at both sides, to listen, to use their words and not their fists, I believe that that's what's gonna happen. I believe that pit bulls are the, as they are called, bullies, they're not. I have association with several pit bulls. I'm a mother, I'm a grandma, I'm even a great grandma. And there isn't a single child that I've had in my entire life that I wouldn't put next to any pit bull that's been raised correctly. They're the most loving, tender animals that you're going to have. I also understand the concern. They are a large breed. They are dangerous if provoked. I'm barely five foot four. Some people in my family say I'm dangerous if I'm provoked. It's all in how you approach it. A across the board ban of a single dog, a single breed, is prejudiced. And I believe in this day and age, people can't be prejudiced. You have to look at the person, male, female. You have to look at the dog. Are they a chihuahua? Are they a pit bull? I've been bit more by chihuahuas than I ever have a pit bull. And I never see a sign that says, ban the chihuahua. Okay, Yorkshire Terriers, Labradors, whatever you do, you can make any, even the sweetest puppy in the world, you can make it mean by how you raise it. I believe that pit bulls should be given a chance. I'm not saying let them loose. Every dog, from the tiniest to the largest, should have to wear a collar, should know where his yard is. But if you come into that yard and you come up to me and you're threatening me, the dog may react badly. You also have to remember, they do not have human intelligence. You can't say, Fido be good. Fido doesn't think like we do. It's the person who has Fido. How did you raise them? How do you treat them? And how do you have them treat your mailman, your UPS driver, your Amazon people, because they come to the door every day at my house. You have to give them a chance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Howard. Hood. I'm sorry, Hood. I apologize. Steve? Hello, my name is Randy Duncan. I reside at 2015 Burnside Drive, Muscatine. And, pardon me? What was your address again? 2015 Burnside Drive, Muscatine. Muscatine. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. 
I, I, I'm against the pit bull thing. Um, uh, I've seen in, here a, three years ago uh, an incident firsthand that really changed my my view on this. Um, it, it was it was terrible. It was vicious. It was vulgar. It was very very bad. Um, and I, I'm a grandfather. I lo I like dogs. I've had dogs, um, but uh, the pit bulls obviously by having having a meeting about this. There's something going on with this this breed, and I know there's other breeds and, and stuff that are uh, big, mean dogs. But um, just by the fact that we're here having this discussion with the community shows me that there's something going on here. Um, uh, I talked to my insurance agent uh, today, and they do write insurance liability for pit bull um, owners, uh, the homeowners insurance. However, there are only two insurance ages, agencies in the in the city. Now, I don't know if it's the county or not, but in Muscatine that will write liability for homeowners insurance. The rest of them won't be with the pit bull. Now, that says something to me, too. So um, I'd like to thank council for uh, bringing this forward to the community and asking for our input. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Steve? Yes. Zelmer? 1122 Park Gavin, Muscatine, Iowa. Um, I listened to him and uh, he said three years ago somebody got attacked. Well, you know, Rottweilers are just as uh, vicious as anything else. And I'm not going to say much because I, I don't believe in the band. You can make any dog mean. It's how they're raised. And like he said three years ago, okay? That means that you can just crucify every every pit bull that's around and that's all I got to say because I don't think it's fair. Thank you. Yep. Tori, please state your name and address. Tori DePaul, 520 Maple Avenue. Um, before I start to rebuttal to one of the things he said, of course the insurance agencies are not going to cover pit bull owners in this town because and it's illegal. Why would uh, they cover something that's illegal? But that's not a problem in other areas. Um, according to the American Temperament Testing Society, the American Pit Bull Terrier achieved a passing rate of 86.8%, better than Collies, Golden Retrievers, and Beagles, which means they rank fourth highest on, of 122 breeds tested. Additionally, a Pit Bull isn't even an actually a breed. It's a term used to describe a stockier type of terrier that includes the American Staffordshire Terrier, American Pit Bull Terrier, Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and mixes of, the bull, of above. Breed labels at shelters are wrong 75% of the time, and the AKC doesn't even recognize pit bulls as a separate breed. So when you're banning them, you are literally giving an, a label to a dog and a pound and not letting them to come here and give them a home, and that might not even be what the kind of animal they are. Half of them are mutts, and you're not allowing them because of what they look like, and <laughs> which is very discriminatory. Uh, researchers have identified the factors that lead to dog bites and breed is not one of them. The factors include non-abled bodied people being around to intervene, the victim having no familiar relationship with the dog, the owner's prior mismanagement of the dogs, and the owner's abuse and ne neglect of the dogs. All legit organizations are against breed bans. The Humane Society of the U.S., the ASPCA, the United Kennel Club, the American Animal Hospital Association, the American Kennel Club, and Best Friends Animal Society, and even the CDC are against breed bans. Dog bite fatalities are extremely rare. Between 1999 and 2006, an average of 27 Americans died that year because of a dog tag. Meanwhile, estimates average that an average of 40 to 50 Americans die each year from lightning strikes. Lightning strikes. So that, have, that kills more people than dogs. There's no evidence that banning breeds have any impact on dog, dog bites. Breed bans waste money. Enforcement costs a fortune from staffing to litigation to the price of unnecessarily killing of dogs in shelters. Best Friends Animal Society offers a calculating that estimates the fiscal impact of $603,000 annually with no reduction in dog bites to show for it. A better solution to dog bite prevention is Enforcement of generic non-breed specific dangerous dog laws with an em emphasis on chronically irresponsible owners. I have sp neighbors behind me with big Labradors, Goldens that get out, have threatened my dogs, my daughter, ha bark at me, and are way scarier than any bulldog that I've ever fostered, adopted, 
or I regularly um, volunteered at, in the Quad Cities at the shelters, and I would specifically spend time with the pit bulls. Here I cannot um, volunteer, but I would for sure do that for every pit bull if I was able to. Um, other things that help would be pro prohibition of dog fighting and education programs on te teaching people how to handle dogs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pa. Please read. We're going to ask folks not to clap just so that we can make sure that we get through everybody's uh, comments. And before you get started, please let me call up the next round. Uh, Freedom, Linda, Marcy, Robin, Maria. Thank you, Faye. Hi, everybody. My name is Faye Sanchez, and my address is 404 Broadway Street. And I won't take too much of your time up today. I have just a couple things that I would like to say. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of people tonight reading off their papers and speaking to you quickly and throwing terms and the word pit bull out a lot. But I'm encouraging you guys tonight to please take a step back and look at the bigger picture, okay, and focus on each individual person and each individual dog and consider their behavior rather than what they look like. Um, I don't think there's anybody here tonight that can say they've had, they know someone who's been attacked by a pit bull or they've had some experience in our community because I think when you take that step back and you look at overall the people that are here today, the people that you've spoken to, the people who have emailed you, there are a lot more potential responsible owners than there are irresponsible people raising their dogs incorrectly. So all we're asking for as a community is a fair chance to prove to you that this is not a breed issue, but a behavioral issue that can be found in any dog breed. Just like there's been other people who have stated they've been bit by chihuahuas, they've been bit by labradors, whatever the breed, I'm just encouraging you guys to please have an open mind and give us a fair chance to prove to you that this breed can be raised properly. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Thank Sanchez. You. Freedom? Good evening. My name is Freedom Malik Roberts. I live at 1836 Hershey Avenue. And first and foremost, my preference is for behavior-specific legislation. Um, however, there were some concerns that came up to me during the in-depth meeting two weeks ago that I think for the benefit of this debate and the benefit of every other debate that this <coughs> council will have moving forward, um, I'd like to address. First is that you need to trust us. Um, there were many people on the council during the in-depth meeting who said things like, regardless of what you guys choose to do, you, can't, you don't know if people will follow the law. You don't think people will obey the law. And if you put in the effort and the research and use the most latest science, facts, logic to build an ordinance, but you say things like you don't think people will follow it or you don't trust that people will obey the law, you undermine yourself, you undermine your power, and that holds Muscatine back. So trust us that no matter what you do, we're going to listen. Secondly, and most importantly, there appeared to be those on the council that were basing their decision out of fear. Because when presented with factual stories, uh, recent events, even local events, where a non-pit bull type dog either attacked somebody, hospitalized them, killed a pet, whether it was a German Shepherd type dog, a Mastiff type dog, uh, a Boxer type dog, getting in these incidents, some on the council are still only interested in banning pit bulls. And some would even sit at their seat of power and tell horror stories about the thing that they are afraid of in order to perpetuate and continue this discriminatory ban instead of actually moving forward with something that helps public safety. So in conclusion, behavior-specific legislation. Trust us and never govern out of fear. Thank you. Thank you, Freedom. Linda. I'm Linda Kelty. I live at 302 Parkington Drive. And I got to get my glasses. I am not speaking extemporaneously because I have numbers <laughs> and I can't do that. 
Um, I went through the city of Muscatine statistics on dog bites. And Muscatine has had a total of 441 animal bites from 2016 or 2006 to the present. The city to statistic details dogs by breed and mixed breed, domestic, feral, or stray cats, and wild animals. And those numbers are all separated in the aggregate. No statistics are available detailing how many of the incidents were repeat offenders. And there was no detailing of the damage done or what level of harm was caused by those bites. From 2006 to the present, there have been a total of 441 bites in Muscatine, 365 or 83 percent from dogs, 66 or 15 percent from cats, 10 or 2 percent from wild animals like rats, bats, and even a groundhog. From 2006 to 2021, 65 breeds of dogs were listed in the statistics. Most had three or fewer biting incidents. Of those, and this is going to really kill some people because we might as well ban these dogs with all these bites, 15 were attributed to German Shepherds, 13 to Labrador Retrievers, 8 to Pit Bulls, 6 to Yorkies. Most breeds only had 1 to 3 bites per breed. Pet ownership is an integral part of our culture here in Muscatine. And I'm sure that the shepherd and lab owners were shocked by the statistics about their breed, but do we ban them? I don't think we ban those breeds. I think that's irresponsible on the part of our leadership to ban a specific breed when what we need to do is ban behaviors and, be and ban bad practices. So. Um, I think we should institute clear and enforceable regulations for responsible pet ownership, whether it's a Shih Tzu, a Chihuahua, or a Malamute. I don't care what dog it is. I think we need universal regulations and standards that can be adhered to. Dogs can be evaluated, trained, cared for, and socialized. A breed ban is simply a fear reaction. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kelty. Marcy Edwards. I live at 2915 Mittman Road. Um, I'm not going to try to cite a bunch of statis statistics because um, I think that a lot of them are skewed and you get them from things like dogbite.org that um, is the equivalent of asking the KKK why you don't like black people. Um, this is racism. I lived in another town for years, and I was not involved with rescue at the time. And I found out about a pit bull that was being abused horrifically in this town. That dog ended up in my care, where we also had a breed ban, and I kept him safe in my garage having no clue why I had to hide this dog. Because this dog, even though it was covered with scars and bites, and the owner was trying to make it mean, this dog didn't have a mean bone in its body. So while being how they're raised does affect any dog, not just this dog, it's also the dog itself. This dog was not mean. and. I was able to find him a responsible home with somebody that had experience, but that was my first rude awakening of rescue, how hard it is to find a good dog a home because it's a victim of humans, not only for its abuse, but because he's discriminated against by his looks. He's a good dog. There are many, many good dogs that need homes and do I think that just lifting the ban and, and saying, well, now anybody can have one? No, I don't. I have Rottweilers. I have always had Rottweilers for years. And I know that there are a lot of people that fear those dogs. Um, I can tell you my Rottweilers are some of the best dogs I've ever seen in my life. The one we currently have is blind. He was a rescue. All of them have been rescues. Um, I would rescue a pity in a heartbeat and that's not even a breed it's just a label um, if you want to get real facts about these dogs 
and the fact that they are the victims, talk to somebody in rescue who rescues these dogs, who sees the worst of humans and what they've done to them, and these dogs still just want to be loved. That's all they want. I looked at that dog as I held that dog with its scars and its scabs, and that dog was the most grateful dog you could even imagine. So we need to stop labeling one breed. Let's start labeling the bad humans and keep them out of their hands. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. <clears throat> Robin? Hi, I'm Robin Young, and I live at 2829 Highland Court. And um, I have um, I am presenting just one piece of some pretty extensive research put together by Vanessa Lopez. So I'm just taking like the first little piece of that and then there are others that will follow. There are I think like five of us. I don't know if they're going in that order or not, but it's, it kind of follows best if we could go in that order. Um, so um, uh, I wanted to share some statements made by some nationally respected sources. Um, and there's a whole ho host of um, reputable organizations in the United States that are uh, strongly opposed to breed-specific legislation. And those include the American Kennel Club, the uh, American Vet Med Association, the American Vet Society of Animal Behavior, um, the National Animal Control Association and the American Bar Association. And I'm just going to tell you some uh, real quick inf information that came from three of these sources. The American Kennel Club says they're strongly opposed to any legislation that de determines a dog to be dangerous based on specific breed or appearance. Um, and when I was here last time, y'all had some discussion about uh, how, uh, th you know, there can be a big-headed dog that is a mix of uh, breeds that, that are not nowhere near related to a, a pit bull, um, but it can be uh, mistaken as a pit bull because of that big chunky head. People see that and go, oh, pit bull, right? Um, and so, um, the, um, their, their rationale, uh, the AKC's rationale, is that um, having breed-specific location is like uh, racial profiling because it unfairly penalizes responsible owners while failing to hold owners of truly dangerous dogs accountable. Um, and that's what we all want here. We want, that's what we want instead of seeing um, pit bulls banned, we want to see dangerous dog owners held responsible, no matter what the breed. Um, the American Vet Med Association said dog bites. Oh, I'm going to skip right over um, to, wow, I talk slow. Um, there are three myths that are pervasive, and um, they are just deeply ingrained in people's psyches. And they are causing hysteria and anxiety, and um, there's no need for them because they're myths. One is the locking jaw. That's not possible. Um, uh, vet, vets say um, that, that there is no such mechanism that causes a pit bull's jaw to lock, nor is that true for any other dog. They don't have a higher pain tolerance to... Um, to pain. They don't have a higher tolerance to pain than any other breed of dog, and they also... Um, do not have the strongest bite force. Um, there are other bigger breeds of dogs that have a much stronger bite force. Thank you, Ms. Young. The presentation. They changed it. So next I'm going to call up Maria Mendoza, and then if we could line up Juan Lopez, Vanessa Lopez, Amanda Lopez, Becky Butler, my time just yet. <laughs> I'll let you state your address first. And then I'll All right. I'm Maria Mendoza, 610 Iowa Avenue. Mayor, Yeah. can I say something? 
Sure. Okay. I'm just uh, for for everybody else that's speaking. If you have uh, uh, information you want to get through, I'd say skip any extraneous info at the beginning that's not related to the information you're trying to present because as soon as you start talking is when this timer starts so even if you're giving an explanation about something besides the actual content your timer already starts so thank you okay that being said can i start yep. yes you sure. can maria please state your name and address you can take your mask off. okay uh, and yes if you want to take your mask off you can so that people can hear you better if you feel more comfortable leaving it on i have baby face that's Thank your you. choice <laughs> firstly any information from dogsbite.org is not reliable it is not an approved source of information and is a blog created by a woman who preaches on anti-pitbull propaganda also, let's not forget the confirmation bias by researching strictly what you want to look for, meaning looking for the answer that you want to hear. For example, if you look up pit bull attacks, those are the articles you'll find. If you look up border collie attacks, those are the articles that you will see. When you have this narrowed vision, you find what you are looking for. Dogs that are visually identified as pit bulls are the fifth most popular family dogs in Iowa, top 10 in the US. Due to their mass popularity and various BSL, many innocent dogs and their owners are unfairly targeted. As of 2016, 17 states have banned BSL. 69 cities and towns of 947 in Iowa have a ban and or restriction in place. That is only 7.9%. In regards to comparison of the 22 cities in Iowa that have a similar population to 20,000 and 30,000, only one, Ottumwa, has a ban. Ottumwa citizens are now protesting the ban and will be facing their council soon. Only one city with, with a population larger than 30,000, being Des Moines, has a restriction. In Muscatine County, we have 11 cities, only three of which have remaining ban. Muscatine, Fruitland, and Walcott. Wilton just lifted their ban a few years ago, the very same night that it was presented to council. The breed that bites the most in Muscatine are Labradors. Why? because they are now the popular breed of dog in town. More bites per popular breed is bound to happen due to there being more of said breed. Now regarding what was stated in the previous meeting, the influx of the alleged pit bull type having 300 to 500 in humane societies in Scott County and Rock Island Humane Society, put this into perspective. Muscatine County has a population of 42,000, Muscatine having 23,000. Scott County has a population of 172,000. Rock Island has a population of about 141,000. Due to the population being nearly 7.5 times as much as Muscatine, those numbers are unfortunate, but not too far-fetched based upon population. 1,899,316 Iowans do not live in a city with a ban or restriction. Approximately 526,046 do. So 3.6 times the Iowans live in a ban-free city. Thank you, Ms. Mendoza. Juan? Please state your name and address. Hello. <coughs> My name is Juan Lopez, uh, 400 Bridge Street, Street, Muscatine, Iowa. Uh, okay, I'll start there. There's there, the, uh, this result was produced by John Dunham, an associate for the uh, Best Friend Animal Society. Uh, it is based on the best available information on dog ownership rates and the cost of animal control program. It is predicted that there are about 6,300 dogs in town, 456 being in people's status, at the number and most likely higher due to the fact owners are hiding their dogs because uh, they don't want them taken. Uh, I also predict that it's higher due to the fact that we have such a low license rate. It costs about $36,000 to keep BSL in Muscatina according to the results. According to the American Veterinarian Society of the Animal behavior, BSL in in ineffective and can lead to a full sense, sense of uh, community safety as well as welfare concerns for dogs that are often 
misidentified mis as belonging to a specific breeds. Bens are extremely ineffective and a waste of public resources. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Vanessa? My name is Vanessa Lopez, and I live at 400 Peachtree Street. So what makes a policy ineffective? They're difficult and impractical to enforce. It discourages compliance with responsible pet ownership. It's costly and diverts resources from real solutions, over and under inclusive and punishes responsible pet owners. The biggest, biggest example of ineffective policies is BSL. It is based on the notion that certain breeds of dogs are more likely to bite or injure than others. It has not succeeded in reducing dog bite injuries, just moves the amount of bites to another dog or breed. It is difficult to enforce as it requires a visual identification of certain breeds and mixes of dogs by law enforcement. An example I can give is that in my neighborhood, a call was made to MPD stating that a pit bull was chasing this woman's cat. That pit bull, in fact, was some corgi mix. It wasted the officer's time as well as the call that was false in its accusation. So how many of the 80 to 90 calls annually that were pit bull related were in fact due to an actual encounter with the pit bull and not to, a, not to a call where the caller misidentified the breed. BSL is very costly as it diverts tax dollars from animal services, consequences that are that it fails to address problematic behaviors of owners and leads to lower compliance with responsible pet ownership ordinances such as licensing. It also places a burden on public departments and creates unsolvable enforcement problems for animal control officers. Also, if ordinances are made to be overly complicated, they most likely won't be followed. The alternative to BSL is to use local resources that um, enforce existing laws to penalize, prosecute, and fine negligent or reckless owners who, are not, who not only abuse dogs but also put their neighbors at risk. So, what are effective policies? They are laws that govern responsible pet ownership, including licensing, vaccination, and leash confinement laws. Those are effective. An example would be in Calgary, Alberta. They enacted a responsible pet ownership bylaw in 2006. It, supported, it focused on support for basic responsible pet ownership behavior, such as humane care, like veterinary care, humane custody, like licensing, and humane control, like following leash laws. Within six years, they had record lows in reported dog bites. In 2012, they had a public education programs and presented to multiple individuals, even at schools. All of that was funded through their licensing um, funds. So 92% of animal calls were successfully resolved through compliance rather than strict enfor enforcements, and 89% of their dogs were licensed. So how can, we, how can our community move toward an effective policy? We need to remove barriers to responsible pet ownership. Most pet owners want to do what's best for their fur babies. A strategy used in Pure Point, New York, is that there were multiple signs across the city reminding residents of their laws and responsible pet ownership. We also need to incentivize compliance with laws. A great example would be the free ride home policy. What that is is when dogs or pets are microchipped, they are returned directly to their families on the first offense instead of impounding the pet to the animal shelter. It saves incurring shelter costs and it would also show the value of compliance with, li with licensing and microchipping. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Amanda? My name is Amanda Lopez. I live at 400 Peachtree Street. Another would be enforce ex existing laws. These are, are animal protection laws that need to be enforced in order, or, order to protect all pets as well as prevent irresponsible ownership. Lastly, focus on education. Examples would be educating children and adults on how to behave safely with dogs, including importance of supervision of children around dogs. Educating the importance of socialization a dog owner to dog owners is also extremely important. I really wish there would be more time to speak on this, but there are multiple alternatives to breed specific legislation as well as multiple ways to increase responsible actions of pet owners. Also, please refer to the packet regarding breed restrictions from Denver, Colorado. Um, you want the next one? 
there are multiple insurance companies who no longer or have ever discriminated against owners of pit bull type dogs. Some examples include Allstate, American Family Insurances, State Farm, Liberty Mutual, Nationwide, and USAA. Here are, here are examples of low cost spay and neuter that are in the Quad Cities. It is important that the public knows what resources are available to them and should be educated on the importance of spaying and neutering their pets. For those that do breed purposely, they should have to pay a breeding license. If owners are breeding their dogs without a license, then there should be a strong fine put in place as well as consequences for, uh, for irresp irresponsible ownership. Responsible owners don't fear this, irresponsible owners do. It's been 18 years since we have failed this breed by putting in place a ban that discriminates against them just because of what they look like. It is time to make a change. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. <laughs> Ms. Butler, you're next. And before you begin, I'd like to call up Sarah Evans, Kathy Dieters, Andrea Wilford, Lisa Schnedler, and Karen Hartman. Please state your name and address and go ahead. My name's Becky Butler, 875 Newell. Some people hear pit bull and think vicious dog. Because of breed specific le dog legislation and neg negative publicity associated with many breeds of dogs, temperament testing has assumed an important role. It can have an impact in educating about dogs' behavioral strengths and weaknesses, as well as providing a positive influence on dog legislation. Have any of you actually met a pit bull or a staffy breed? Or are you just going off of fear tactics from uneducated people? Or a few newspaper articles you have read? Or are you willing to actually go by educated experts and stats from reputable organizations such as the American Temperament Test Society? The ATTS came to what some might consider a shocking conclusion. Their data shows pit bull staffy breeds that Muscatine City Council has banned pass the temperament test higher than Huskies, Golden Retrievers, German Shepherds, Rottweilers, and Great Danes. The, ATT, the ATTS test focuses on and measures different aspects of temperament, such as stability, shyness, aggressiveness, and friendliness, as well as the dog's instinct for protectiveness towards the handler and or self-preservation in the face of a threat. The test stimulates everyday life situations encountered. The dog is put through a series of 10 subtests sub that mirror life in the real world. Other dogs, strangers, loud startling noises, strange ob objects, and more. According to their testing, pit bulls are less likely to show aggression than one of America's most beloved breeds, the Golden Retriever. People seem to make up their minds and refuse to look at the real evidence. News stations love to pump up stories every time a pit bull is involved in a violent encounter and a lot of athletic build with blocky head mixed breeds are called pit bulls just to create drama. It is sad that people feel they must create this illusion that simply is not true. Please look at the facts like the majority of you have said you would do. Not just a very biased staff report with very minimal information that only met his agenda. Then you will see that pit bull staffy breed isn't the most vicious breed in the entire country like one of the council members said. Growing up, I witnessed a Great Dane jump a fence, grab a little boy off of his bike, and shake him like a rag doll. There was nothing to provoke that dog. After that, I wanted nothing to do with Great Danes. They were horrible, mean dogs. We currently have four Great Danes and a Great Dane mix in our neighborhood. I have met them, and they are wonderful dogs. I get it. It is easy to, be, to put your biased opinions aside. I did thank goodness because I have met many wonderful Great Danes. If any of you would like to meet a pit bull or a staffy to see how they really act or how they are, reach out to It Takes a Village for Animal Rescue and they will be happy to help. Nothing is better than to personally meet one. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Sarah Evans. Hi, Sarah Evans at 2015 Solomon. Um, I'm not coming with a lot of facts or cite, cite to sources to cite, thank you. But I personally um, have an American Bulldog and she's not a pit bull, but she has a block head, she has a block body and she's gorgeous and beautiful and wonderful. And her name is Fergie. 
And um, one time I took Fergie to the park with my children when she was about eight months old, and I was screamed at by someone that was not knowledgeable about pit bulls or any breed for <coughs> my understanding, um, that it was a pit bull, watch out children, it's going to attack, it will get you, you don't have to do anything, it's going to get you. And this was a pivotal moment in my life because I had done all the research and was told this breed was phenomenal with families and children and she really was, Fergie really was. And the woman that was screaming this was irate and very passionate and I can appreciate that, but what, I, what she didn't see beyond her fear was that Fergie was sleeping under the bench at my feet. She was a block-headed puppy and so she was bad. She was a terrible, terrible dog. She's now eight, she has medical issues, she's wonderful. I've raised three children with this dog. I have had countless numbers of children come in and out of my house with this dog and they all love her, she loves them all. But because of that block head, she's been labeled. And that wasn't my first, or that was not my only experience. So we adopted another dog that was a mutt, part lab, part Doberman, and she's passed. But because of her and the American Bulldog, we were kicked off of our insurance. We were discriminated against because of the dogs. We had to sign papers saying, if something happens with these horrible, vicious, mean dogs, we will be forced to pay out of pocket, the insurance company will not pay, and then we moved because that was ridiculous. I was discriminated against. Both of my dogs had gone through years of obedience classes, or at least multiple classes over years, <laughs> and they'd passed, and they were wonderful specimens for their breeds. But because of what they looked like or the fear that people have of attack breeds, Dobermans, Rottweilers, German Shepherds, Pit Bulls, Bulldogs, we were discriminated against. Anyway, so the thing about the insurance company I have to say is that for more money they would have covered us. Let's remember that insurance is in fact a business and that they don't really have the facts. They will take your money though. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Kathy Dieters. I'm Kathy Dieters. My address is 2455 Longhurst Court. Um, I have a few quotes here, um, so I'll, I'll need to read them. Um, organizations involved in human and canine interaction are opposed to breed-specific legislation. The American Veterinary Association says, when a specific breed of dog is selected for control because of identification of the dog's breed with certainty, is with certainty necessary to impose sanctions on the dog's owner is impossible. Such, ordinance, such ordinances have been considered unconstitutionally vague and therefore violate due process. The U.S. Center for Disease Control says because of difficulties inherent in determining a dog's breed with certainty, enforcement of breed-specific ordinances raises constitutional and practical issues. The National Animal Control Association says any animal may exhibit aggressive behavior regardless of breed. Accurately identifying a specific animal's lineage for prosecution purposes, for prosecution purposes may be extremely difficult. Um, most pit bull ordinances contain language that say something in the order of any dogs of mixed breed, breed would have the appearance of being predominantly pit bull. And I'm going to give you a quick list of dogs that could look like pit bulls. American Bulldog, Australian Cattle Dog, Boston Terrier, Boxer, Bull Mastiff, Cane Corso, Catahoula Leopard Dog, Doggo Argentina, English Bulldog, French Bulldog, Greater Swiss Mountain Dog, Rhodesian Ridgeback, Sharpe, Avisla, and many mixed breed dogs. It's very common for any dog with brindle coloring also to be, to be labeled as pit bull, but there's many dogs that have brindle coloring too, such as American Bulldogs, Boxers, Boston Terrier, Corgis, Dachshunds, French Bulldogs, Great Danes, Greyhounds, Mastiffs, English, bu English Bulldogs, and plot hounds. So one of the real effects of the breed specific legislation is good owners of pit bull type dogs 
decide to leave the city if they're unable to comply with the restrictions in the city or, or lose their family pet, move it or lose it. Any dogs with blocky heads, stocky builds, and short hair are unfairly targeted. Non-law-abiding citizens who keep the breed for bad purposes either hide their dogs or switch to another breed. They simply do not care about their dogs and the law. Consumer resources, cons um, the, one of the, another of the effects of the breed-specific le legislation is it consumes the resources that could be otherwise directed at real issues such as inhumane treatment of, and dogs running at large and truly dangerous dogs. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Dieters. Andrea Wilford. Hi, I'm Andrea Wilford, 1025 Orchard Avenue. Um, I was present at City Council when the first ban was enacted, and I supported it then, and I brought students down here. I had some that had dogs that they didn't, they didn't want the ban, because but they got grandfathered in. And I'm here today because I, I still support it. And, um, um, you know, I'm just kind of at a loss for words. I'm thinking of the 1899 city ordinance, because I have the Muscatine 1899 city ordinance, because I was thinking about some of the things Kathy just said. And I was like, in 1899, it cost $165 in today's dollars. $5 in is $165 to register a dog in Muscatine. And they didn't have anything breed specific. Uh, they just, that's what it cost. And if a female registered dog was running down the street, the ordinance said the officers of the city automatically needed to kill that dog regardless. Any female dog running free. Well, there's a reason for that. I mean, if anybody comes from a farm, you know, we have pets, we have working dogs, we have guard dogs, dogs that protect us. And nowadays, we're all about dogs for companionship, and that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, I know when the city ordinance was first uh, for the ban was enacted, I just remember the, the pit bull fights. And then I thought, well, maybe, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. But, geez, just last October 7th, they busted up a tri-state ring in New York and Georgia and whatever. And I saw these pit bulls, and, yeah, they're adorable. I saw puppies, they rescued about 400 of them. And the number one dog you're gonna see in shelters is pit bulls, whether because they've been broken up from rings or people couldn't take care of them or there were issues with children. And uh, I know there's this strong desi desire, it seems like that I wasn't aware of, that we wanna bring pit bulls to our town and adopt them out. But you know what? I've lived here 40 years, I've been bit three times, all by responsible dog owners. It, and they weren't pit bulls, but um, riding my bike, Gary Karkosh's dog out in the country bit me, didn't break the skin, and I didn't blame the dog. <laughs> He's protecting his property. I don't like it when big dog, one day, just two years ago, I was walking my dog down my street, and the neighbor's dog broke through the fence and, and ripped him in the stomach. Uh, that wasn't that dog owner's responsibility. I mean, he was being responsible, but I guess, okay, I only have 30 seconds, so... Uh, I guess I want you to think about the safety of the town, and it is your responsibility to look at the facts and to uh, keep us safe. Because I, I wanna be able to walk my small dog, and uh, yeah, you know what, I'd ban all dogs over 50 pounds. You don't wanna be breed specific, just get rid of the big dogs. I, little old ladies and old gentlemen I know should be able to walk their dogs down the street of Muscatine and not fear of getting bit. Thank, more time, but I don't. Thank you, Ms. Wilford. Lisa Schnedler. You might have, there you go. Hello, everybody. I wasn't planning on public speaking, but this is something I'm passionate about as a dog lover. Would, do you mind please starting with your name and address? My name is Lisa Snedler. I live at 1518 First Avenue. Thank you. Um, I've had dogs my whole life. Never a pit bull, but you know, honestly, I would be afraid to have one just because I would be afraid the city would take it away from me. Um, for that matter, I'm not gonna quote any statistics. Thank you for all the people who support, support, support um, no 
breed specific legislation because I don't think it works as well. And um, I can say I, I was a r runner. I ran around this town. I'm due to injury, I'm not running anymore, but I came into contact with a lot of dogs by accident. Lots of them. And yeah, I'm also kind of stupid and I'll go up to any dog. <laughs> so um, I will say that I never had issues with pit bulls. I'm just speaking from my experience and I hope that people who are against it would actually speak from their experience. Um, Cause that's what you know. I, I've been never been bitten by a pit bull, luckily. I've been bitten by other dogs. Of course, they're all small dogs. And honestly, I, it was probably my fault. I was a little kid and I probably wasn't being, I was a little kid. I <laughs> wasn't probably being very nice and that they can't speak. That's how, that's how they tell us. Just like an, I work with people with disabilities. That's what a nonverbal, a nonverbal person that I've worked with would spit at me. Well, he can't talk. But he could tell me he's pissed off by saying, by spitting at me. You know, that's how he can express himself. Um, I have been to Best Friends Animal Society in Utah. I have met some of the Victory Dogs. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Victory Dogs, but those are all the pit bulls that Michael Vick and his ring of people made into fighting animals for, really, they were just property. They weren't pets they weren't loved they were they weren't taken care of uh i think pit bulls have a bad rap and before maybe pit bulls had that there was german shepherds that had it there was <coughs> rottweilers that had it um Dobermans. i can't say i've ever met a Doberman in real life actually but i've met many <laughs> rottweilers and german shepherds and they have all been sweet dogs um as a runner, like I said, I can only speak from my experience, and I'm also not very smart. I'd go up to any dog that I saw. I never had an issue with the pit bull. I've met a few running. Um, like I said, as a kid, I had issues with small ones, apparently. But I'll take some of that. Some of that is <laughs> my fault. But I can just tell you from meeting pit bulls, going to the Best Friends Animal Society, I'm supporting, volunteering at the Humane Society, that. I believe it's the behavior, not the breed. Thank you, Ms. Schnedler. Karen, did you want to go first? Yes. Okay. I have um, these one for everybody. So. Hi, I'm Karen Hartman, 1555 West Acre Drive. And um, I, we are here today um, because we need a dangerous dog ordinance to replace this breed ban um, because the pit bull ban just doesn't work. Um, the rights uh, and re of responsible owners are being restricted because of this ban. Um, we need to hold the owners accountable and create laws that punish those that you target. And I have a fine group of kids here who would like to uh, read some information to you. So, um, Griffin, go ahead. You have your paper. I'm Griffin Keeler, and uh, my address is 1512 Bidwell Road. Did you get that, Cinda? No. Please say it again. Uh, my address is 1512 Bidwell Road. And your name is? Griffin Keeler. Did you get it? Can you spell your last name? K-O-E-H-L-E-R. What was it? K-O-E-H-L-E-R. It's Megan. Yeah. Okay. Please continue. The American Kennel Club strongly opposes any legislation that determines a dog to be dangerous based on specific breeds or pheno phenotypic cl classes of dogs. Regulations that target specific force law specific breeds force law enforcement officials to focus their valuable time on breed identification. This task requires expert knowledge of the inv individual breeds and can be compounded when the law includes a mixed breeds. It is very difficult for public officials to enforce such, prov such provisions in a fair and effective manner. Dog bite statistics are not really statistics, and they do not give an accurate uh, picture of dogs that bite. Invariably, the numbers will show that dogs from popular large breeds are a problem. This should be expected because big dogs can physically do more damage if they do bite. Any popular breeds have has more individuals that could bite. Dogs from small breeds also bite and are capable of causing severe injury. These are several reasons why it is, it is not possible to calculate a bite rate for a breed or to compare rates between breeds. 
Statistics on fatalities and injuries caused by dogs cannot reasonably use, be used to, to document the dangerousness of particular breeds relative to other breeds for several reasons. Hi. Hi, my name is Jackson Evans, and my address is 2015 Solomon Avenue. Thank you. Um, American Veterinary so Society of Animal Behavior states, any dog may bite regardless of the dog's size or sex or reported breed or mix of breeds. The AVSAB's position is that such legislation, often called breed-specific legislation, or BSL is ineffective and can lead to a false sense of community safety as well as welfare concerns for dogs identified as belonging to specific breeds. Centers for Disease Control and Pre Prevention states the CDC recommends against using breed as a factor in dog bite pre prevention policy states any dog of any breed has the potential to bite. Thank you. Mayor, if I may ask quickly yes. for a point of order. Are we, are, are, is each speaker getting each three minutes? Each one is three minutes. Okay. Yes. Are you starting the? Okay. We'll go start. Hello, my, hello. My name is Garrick Fillmore, and my address is two not two nine zero seven Allen Street. Allen Street. Breeds breed specific le, le, legislations may create a undue burden to owners who otherwise have demonstrate pr, demonstrated proper pet management and responsibilities. Agents. Agencies who who have demonstrated proper pet management and res oh sorry. Sh agencies should encourage an enactment and stri st stringent stringent en enforcement of dangerous, vicious dog laws. A trend in preve preventation of dog bites continues to shift in favor of multi. Multifact multifactual uh, approach approaches focusing on improving ownership and hus husbandry practices, be better understanding of dog behavior, education of parents and children regarding safety around dogs, and consists of enforcement of dangerous dog re rec reckless owners ordinance ordinances in communities. Effective laws hold a all all dog owners responsible for, for the human care, cus, custody, and control of all dogs, regardless of their breed or type. Thank you. I am Briar Evans. I live at 2015 Solomon Avenue. State Farm Insurance, we do not ask nor do we care for what breed of dog is owned by a person. So we, so when we are writing homeowners insurance, rents, rental insurance, or renewing policies, policy, policies, it is no na now here in our questions what breed of dog is owned. Heather Paul, public offers specialist. Thank you. My name is Is my name is Isabel Keeler. I live on fifteen twelve Bidwell Rose Road. <laughs> from the American Bar Association. The American Bar Association urges all state, territorial, and local legislative bodies and governmental agencies to adopt comprehensive, breed-neutral, dangerous dog and reckless owner laws that ensure due process protections for owners, encourage responsible pet ownership, and focus on the behavior of both dog owners and dogs, and to repeal any breed discriminatory or breed-specific provisions. The CDC officials found that 50 children aged one or older who were killed by dogs in the U.S. from 1979 to 1988. 28% had wandered too close to a chained dog. A similar 1996 study, partly authored by CDC officials, found that nearly 30% of 38 children aged 1 to 9 killed 
by dogs in the U.S. between 1989 and 1994 died after wandering too close to a chained dog. I understand the implications of what we have just read. Do you? Thank you, Ms. Keeler. I'm Peyton Story of 416 Kindler Avenue. Did you get that? Can you please say it again? 416 Kindler Avenue. And your name? Peyton Story. Peyton Story. That's with an E. <laughs> Got it. Please go ahead. I love pit bulls. Pit, I once, one time I was on a trip to Kansas. I met a pit bull. It was... <laughs> It was one of the most amazing dogs I've ever met. It was a, it was a really, it was a really sweet dog, and I'm pretty sure more than half the time that pit bulls are mean, it comes from the owners. Because most dogs I've seen, even my own dog, are, they they act from behavior that they've seen. My dog Sadie, I'm really nice to her, and and she loves to snuggle. And I just, I, I love pit bulls. And I just wish that there wasn't a ban on them. Because pit bulls, they, they may seem mean, they may seem strong. But in reality, they're as strong as any other dog of their size. Any, any dog can be stronger. But with the right, but with the right care... They can be they can be nicer than any dog you've ever met. My whole point is is there should be there should be punishments for people that that treat the, that treat any kind of dog, pit bulls, chihuahuas, great danes, whatever. That there should be punishments for bad for bad treatment. Thank you, Peyton. Next, I'm sorry, I didn't get the next group up. Casey Keeler, Megan Keeler, Paul Connor, and Chantel Durant. Am I saying that wrong? All right. So we have, please state your name, Casey. Hello, my name is Casey Keeler. I live at 1512 Bidwell Road here in town. Um, I'm currently active duty Navy and I am the vice president of It Takes a Village Animal Rescue and Resources here in town. Um, over the last seven months, our organization has helped save over 150 animals from being euthanized. Um, I've had my hands in and around the mouth of every one of these animals, whether it be giving them a bath or meds or vaccines, wherever the case may be, and not once have I felt threatened by having my hand near a pit bull's mouth. Um, I've had them near mastiff puppies. I've had them near full-grown labs and full-grown German shepherds and everything else and the only thing that's ever come close to making me even remotely nervous was a really big German shepherd and that was it and that guy was not happy with me but he loved Megan this was cool um, at the end of the day I'm here to talk about the misconceptions that have been drilled into our heads by the media okay um, do you know the reason why pit bulls are considered bad it's a narrative created by the media that far too many people have fallen for hook line and sinker there's many staunch supporters against pit bulls because of the preconceived notions as opposed to personal experiences. All right? Talk radio told me these dogs are bad is not a very good reason to be against pit bulls. Our last meeting two weeks ago, we had a city council member proudly and confidently claim numerous times that pit bulls are, quote, the meanest dog in the country, and also stated that he's an active advocate for the ban. Do you think those very strong opinions came from a personal experience? Or was it more likely he was told to think that because of various news outlets? I'm pretty sure the Google search that most people do regarding this subject stops as soon as they see pit bulls bad. End of research, I've seen enough. You all know what sells in the media these days. Headlines draw, negative headlines draw the attention, not the positive ones. Good Lord, there's a show on TV called Pit Bulls and Parolees. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I lost where I was now. Um, it's actually about how abused and abandoned an dogs are helped out and loved by former inmates, but the name and the thumbnails that are associated with it make it look like it's something about bad people with bad dogs and bad intentions. 
A quick look at it makes people clutch their pearls in fear and disgust and drives home the, that the image of these animals are dangerous. Pit bulls being bad is a false narrative that has been contaminating your point of view for a long time. There are stories of horrific dog attacks that have a headline of, quote, family dog attacks little child, and there's a picture of the pit bull on the front when it's actually a chihuahua, but it doesn't say it till the last sentence, right? There's a lot of things that have happened in the last 18 years. iPhones were invented four years later. We've gone through three freaking popes by then. Sorry, three popes. That probably wasn't good. Uh, <laughs> hold on. At the end of the day, what I'm getting at is that there were many of you on the council two weeks ago that said you want to hear what the people had to say. So far, it's looking like it's about 23 to 2. And the two, one was an insurance claim that wasn't real, and one was inside an 1899 something or other. So BSL needs to be lifted, not tomorrow, or not in a week, not in two months, not in six months. It needs to be soon. It needs to be now. It needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keeler. Let's please refrain from clapping, guys. Thank you. Paul, yeah. state your name and address, please. I am Paul Connor, 1204 Cedar Street. I am an active pit bull owner. My dogs are right now out on the farm. They are my babies. I want them to come home. You know, I've raised pit bulls pretty much my whole life. And I'm not going to say that dogs are, are bad. Us humans are worse. So are we going to ban humans? How can we ban dogs? I want my babies to come home. You know, that's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Connor. I'm sorry I skipped Ms. Keeler. I was the last one to OK. Well, not on mine, but it's OK. It's OK. Go ahead, Chantel. Please state Chantel your name. Chantel Durant. I live at 1204 Cedar Street. Did you get that? What's your last name? Durant, D-U-R-A-N-T. Thank you. And I know I'm meaner than my pit bulls are. <laughs> I got four pits, and I'm a lot meaner than what they are. But my pits, it doesn't matter if it's you guys all the way down to a police officer, my pits want to hug you. I got two pits that just want to hug anybody and everybody that they come up to. One will force you to hug her. She'll dig her claws in your back and make you hug her. But um, my pits are, they're loving. They're, they're fun. They want to play. They, and they are. They're forced right now to be out in um, Grandview on a farm. And even though I know they like to run around the farm, I know they want to be home with us just like I want them home with us. Those are our kids. They're our child. That's, they're my children. So um, pits are all in how you raise them and how you want them to be, how you, how you, it's just on how you raise them. If you're going to raise them to be fighting dogs, then they're going to be fighting dogs. But like I said, my pits want to hug you. They don't get ag aggressive or anger or, or they don't have, show any kind of like, I don't even know the word for it really. They don't show any kind of aggression just because you're a police officer. They don't get riled up because you're wearing a suit, or they just because you're walking by down the street, they don't get riled up because there's someone they don't know. They just want to play with you. That's all they do. So it's all in how you raise them. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Ant. Megan? Hello. My name is Megan Keeler. I, am, I live at 1512 Bidwell Road here in town. I am a citizen and also the president of It Takes a Village Animal Rescue and Resources here in Muscatine. I'm here to talk about how we can create safer communities. I think that we can all agree that we have the same goal in mind when we are considering our local laws and ordinances. The discussion is not about whether you are a pit bull lover or even a dog lover. It is very much an understanding, um, this is about an understanding of where dog bites come from. Uh, if we're going to have an effective ordinance, that's something that we need in order to keep us safe. With regards to animal welfare, making communities safer involves putting in place effective regulations on how owners maintain and care for the pets instead of limiting the breed of animal in your community. The fact of the matter is that all dogs can be dangerous, and if we don't recognize that as a community and as community leaders, then we are putting ourselves at an even higher risk for incidents within our community. Indisputable evidence shows us that leading contributing factor in dog bites is actually chain dogs and dogs that are not neutered. It is not at all breed related. Because a tethered dog is on guard, 
they are a guard, a dog on guard when, when tethered. This is a primal reaction, and it changes their focus to fight or flight. Um, flight's not an option when you're on a tether, so your only option is fight, and it's actually a sympathetic nervous system response in canines. So what that means is they go to fight in order to defend themselves just by nature of being on a chain, on a leash. Now, we know this to be true. This is why we have no leash allowed inside the dog park. Because again, a dog on a leash is a dog on guard. That's why leashes aren't allowed inside the play area. So according to a study from the CDC and prevention physicians, chained dogs are nearly three times more likely to attack than dogs that are not tethered. Children are the most common victims of chained dog attacks. Chaining a dog is arguably the single most dangerous condition in which to maintain a dog. And statistically, chained dogs are more dangerous than free roaming dogs in a pack. Now let's talk about unaltered dogs. The National Canine Research Foundation says there is literally not one single documented case where a neutered household dog caused a human fatality. That is by National Canine Research Foundation. The CDC says that an unaltered dog is nearly three times more likely to attack than an altered dog. According to the American Veterinary Medicine Medical Association, 70 to 76 percent of all dog bites are by non-neutered male dogs. The, the Humane Society of the United States took it a step further and computed that for every one dollar spent on a local spay and neuter program, it saved animal control three dollars for gathering and impoundment of animals. In 2011, the city of Washington, Iowa, got rid of their pit bull ban and they instead put in place tethering laws and owner responsibility laws. The, in the numbers for stray dogs, dogs at large in 2011, was 94 dogs. Last year, it was two. BSL simply doesn't make us safer. It doesn't, and it, this isn't me or animal rights or animal welfare organizations saying this, but our federal health agencies like the CDC, the veterinary experts like AVMA, the Iowa Department of Agriculture, the USDA, the National Canine Research Council, the National Animal Control Association, they all recognize that BSL does not work and is not a contributing factor in the reduction of dog bites in communities. Thank you, Ms. Keeler. Thank you for your time. We have a couple folks that are with us online. And I will call on you. Are you can you get them up, Kevin? Get rid of the PowerPoint. Brooklyn Harris, you're going to be up first. Can you hear me? Pardon me. She needs to unmute herself. Can you unmute yourself, Brooklyn? Uh, I actually don't want to speak. Everyone pretty much said what I was going to say. Thank you. Yep. Brandy Lindstrom. Lundstrom. Hi there. Perhaps. Yep, Lundstrom. Could you state your address, please? 1210 East 4th Street. Are you ready? What was her I'm ready. 1220 what was your... East 4th Street, is that correct, Brandy? Uh, 1210 East 4th Street. 1210 East okay. 4th Street. Please go ahead. She has started the timer. Okay. Well, I'll keep it short because I have two little ones here. Um, I'm in favor of keeping and strictly enforcing the ban in, in addition to holding dog owners in general to a higher standard than they are currently. I'm a stay-at-home mom. My husband's a mail carrier, and he's also the sole provider for our family. And we stand to lose so much more than peace of mind if the ban is, the ban is overturned. Uh, honestly, there's nothing to be gained from re repealing the pit bull ban. We already cannot rely on people to do the responsible thing by properly training, registering, and keeping their current dogs regardless of the breed. And there's absolutely no way we can depend on an entirely new group of people to do so with a breed that has proven time and time again how unpredictable they are. There's no way to tell a good pet from a bad one until it's too late. And that's not a chance I'm willing to take when I'm at a park or on a walk with my kids. And for those of you on the council who are on the fence about the ban, I implore you to stand up for what's right instead of trying to do what's nice. 
and it could be a matter of life and death, and the blood will be on your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lundstrom. Next, we have Preston Moore. Please state your name and address. Uh, good evening. My name is Preston Moore. Uh, I live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, I'll decline to give my full address. I'm happy to provide it for the public record later. Please um, do so. Sure. My name is Preston Moore. I am the Iowa State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. I'm here tonight uh, to repeat some some information that I have provided to the council already. I'm not going to provide a bunch of statistics because the locals have done an amazing job of that. And I want to let everyone in the room know that even though you all aren't clapping in between speakers, I've been clapping for all of you tonight. I think everyone's done an incredible job of getting the facts and statistics to the city. Uh, I am here tonight to reiterate to the city of Muscatine our expert recommendation that the city council work to draft and implement a breed neutral dangerous animal policy. Here in Iowa, I have been very fortunate to work alongside countless cities on animal ordinances, including working on breed neutral animal policies for many Iowa cities. I've worked with several government agencies, including the Iowa Department of Agriculture for their animal welfare rules, as well as the Iowa Department of Inspection and Appeals for their dogs on patio rules. I've also worked very closely with state lawmakers, including Governor Kim Reynolds, to pass the first animal cruelty code upgrade in Iowa's history in 20 years. I am a bit of a policy nerd when it comes to animal policy. Uh, in each of the situations I've outlined above, I was privileged to work alongside legislators and other leaders throughout the state so that we can help get our expert policy guidance to these decision makers and communities so that they can base their policies on current best practices. Uh, tonight, again, I'm simply here to reiterate uh, our expert guidance to the city, and we recommend that the city work quickly to implement a breed neutral dangerous animal policy. And we stand ready to assist the city uh, with this effort. Again, at no cost, our legal team is willing and able and ready to assist. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. I believe you have uh, the email address that you could send your address. So that was I'll the last. Thank you. That was the last that we had uh, for folks who had asked to speak. So, and that's the last thing that we have on the agenda tonight. I would ask council um, if they are comfortable having some, an opportunity for them to go home and think through and read their notes from everything that people said tonight. And then on a, a future agenda, we will um, have an opportunity to discuss. Is that good with everyone? Did you have a, a suggestion as well? Uh, no, I just um, I want to make sure I get some guidance on when you would like to c for us to come back. I know based on the feedback we received at the in-depth session, we're working on propo proposed code, uh, which I mentioned will take a little bit of time to develop. So are you looking for a uh, um, discussion item on an upcoming agenda just relative to the feedback you heard tonight or do you want to do something else what was what is the time frame that you're thinking that you would have some policy suggestions ready hmm. I don't want to <laughs> I'm not I'm not tying you down yeah uh, I mean it probably uh, maybe December so, council, uh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I, I think I'd like to see uh, what is drafted so we can discuss the, the mechanics of that as well. And then we can move forward with more discussion, maybe tweaking some more before we sit down and decide what we're voting on and know where we are. And it's kind of hard to go on a trip if you don't have Google or <laughs> uh, Quest Map to show you where you're going. And, and I think uh, with the holidays coming up and uh, staff already overloaded, maybe we need to throttle back and let them do what they do and then come, because that's what we asked uh, two weeks ago, I think, or you know, please put something together to us and show it to us and let's read it and let us think about it. Plus, we have all this to read. Plus, thank you, citizens for all the stuff I've been reading for the past three days. Oh my God. We've been getting emails from uh, people who no, aren't here tonight. Wait a minute, emails, text messages. I have people calling my, my wife unplugged my phone in the house. Oh my God. <laughs> so, you know, but that's what we needed. 
and, and I really want to thank you for your passion and your opinion, either negative, positive, because I said from the beginning, I need to hear what the people wanted so we know how to talk and move in that direction. That, 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 that's, you know. So I, I think I need to see what uh, the professionals have for us to ponder and think, but I also don't want you to push through and give me something cheap and flimsy. Give me your A game. Any other thoughts? Go ahead, Peggy. Uh, Carol, do you have something? I just that we'll, we won't bring it back until we think we have something that's worthy for you to look at. So it, but I will tell you it incorporates, I think most of what folks this evening have talked about and what we highlighted regarding um, behavior-based type uh, mm -hmm. legislation um, in, not, and I'm not talking about the pit bull ordinance, I'm talking about what we would add to the keeping uh, the animal regulations code chapter eight. So I just wanna make, make sure that we're clear on what we're talking about amending, yeah. Um, I'd like to recommend that we, because we have only two meetings in November, it's a short month, that the first, we got to have a stretch here. It needs to come at least some initial thoughts. Early December is what I would highly recommend. And like you said, it's more about the behavior-based regulation, the tethering laws that we might already have uh, some basic foundation from uh, previous information that Nicole and the police department had created. And... Um, then also the licensing, we cannot let that go. That's not a request anymore. I think we can probably see what we can move forward because until we get that information, it's gonna help get dogs back into their homes. And then there's some soft things that we need to work on. Like we said, education is one of them. We need to come out with a program, but that's not for December. That's sort of future state. Yeah, the, there'll be a couple phases to this. One will be bringing back sort of a, almost like a term terms uh, yeah. about what the new code would require. Mm -hmm. uh, and based on what I heard, that t tethering, licensing, um, uh, de definition of dangerous, potentially dangerous. Uh, but there may be other codes based on review of other model codes I might recommend that we take a look at. That first part will be just looking at what code you may consider for adoption. The second part of that discussion is implementation and how do we make that happen. And so that that's a longer conversation. Um, so it, like I mentioned last time, this any kind of major change in a, an ordinance like this what requires uh, prudent prudent thought. Right, and covering with legal and multiple votes and everything. And this try not to adopt the Denver one because that is pages, as Vanessa shared with us. Mm -hmm. It has some great FAQs, but it is massive. So this try to keep what we've been moving towards and keeping it clear and concise and simple to, to em enforce and implement. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Brock. Um, I would also support waiting until December to come forward with any new uh, code language, especially in view of the upcoming election where we will have at least one new member on council going forward in January, and they need to be included in the discussion as well. Thank you. Go ahead. So I, I would I want to thank everybody that came and spoke tonight, regardless of which side of the issue that you're on. Um, it, it's very it, it was very important to me to hear from everybody. Uh, I will say that what I heard tonight did did nothing except for reinforce the stance that I already had. So one of the things that that I you know that was mentioned by folks tonight, but that I don't know that we have said that I would like to see incorporated into our code is a way for us to ban bad owners, people that have shown to abuse their dogs, people that have shown to kill their animals or just let their dogs, you know, or cats for that matter, roam entirely free on a regular basis after re repeated warnings, that just keeps happening. That's how most of the attacks that I hear about happen. <laughs> Thanks for the sound effects, um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if we're not going to do, if we're not, if we're going to do all the rest of this, no matter which direction we go, if we're gonna if we're gonna change the code, we need a way to police the people that are causing the problem. Yeah. So, guys, let's. So let's try two, not to clap the two if codes we can. that I I referenced in the in depth were 
model codes that include either what's called a reckless owner or an irresponsible owner mm -hmm. a provision that that will be in what I bring back to council I Perfect. think the question is um, you know how have how heavy-handed do we want to be and we have to keep in mind um, how realistic it is to enforce because I don't think we want to adopt anything that's too difficult to actually enforce sure um, somebody caught with an animal after they've been banned should have a, a hefty fine at a minimum and hefty being you know in excess of five hundred dollars in my opinion if they've been banned from having an animal due to abuse situations they should not freely be able to obtain another yeah we'll do some research on fine fine the level of the fine perfect um, other, other than that um, I, I do agree that we need to get this right when we do it and as much as I would love to see it tomorrow um, I I don't disagree with the council that has stated that December would be a good time frame because if we don't do it right, we're not doing an, any anything effective. So, Dennis, Dwayne, do you have anything you wanted to I'm, add? I'm in total agreement with Kelsey. Okay. John, I Andrew. agree. I uh, I think we need to do everything we can to make sure our city is safe and uh, take every opportunity to make sure we uh, impose whatever restrictions are necessary to make sure that we have a safe community. And uh, I appreciate everybody's comment tonight. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll look forward to uh, certainly future uh, conversations. I, I believe that whatever we do, it's got to be for the best for the citizens, no matter what it is. And until that gets to that point where I feel comfortable, then we gotta, we need to work on it. We're we're not anywhere near close, so that's my comment. Did you have a final thought? Just just fun. I mean, I just count. We had over thirty some people respectfully make their comments and had their data and had it lined up. Sometimes it was presentations. Sometimes it was from the heart, and that doesn't happen a lot nowadays. And you know whether it was. What side you're on it was I mean it was great to see and I'm sure Dave's gonna put wonderful things in the paper about that I'm sure uh, but thank you for coming um, is, I mean that's I mean I just did a quick count I'm not I didn't count all the kids Karen mm -hmm. uh, but it made it over 30 people that actually spoke so and we and I think you've heard from all of our council that uh, hearing from the public and following their lead is really where they want to be and so thank you all so much for making what could have been uh, a, an uncomfortable night for a lot of folks be very uh, informative and respectful to everyone. Carol, do you have what you need to move forward? I think so. Okay. Hearing nothing else, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. We're adjourned. <laughs>